And that's the reason why you don't turn your AC down at your house because there's no monetary incentive for you to do that. What is this? So we've been working with several of our member companies around how do we describe to the general public who don't really understand about the grid what different types of load means? How does a grid even work? What's a duck curve? We covered that a little bit last week. So uh, you guys can see this behind me. This is a graph that spans a continuum of different load resources. By load resources, we just mean consumers of energy um, on any given grid, right? So on from the from starting to like the worst side uh, of the scale, you've got residential loads. Residential loads are the least flexible. We turn uh, our AC's on in the summer when it gets hot, and we don't turn those off until we our house cools to whatever 72 degrees or whatever we have it set on. Um, then you've got inflexible small commercial loads, inflexible large commercial loads, and inflexible industrial loads. These are all loads that have to be on on a consistent basis in order for uh, their business operations. So uh, those are not going to be helpful for grid operators because they're always on, which means they're adding to peak demand. Um, and then you've got the flexible loads, flexible large commercial loads, flexible industrial loads, and Bitcoin mining. Um, so these are loads that are interruptible. And the reason why Bitcoin mining is furthest to the green or furthest to the side of, of most advantageous for grid operators is because they are the most flexible load. They're able to turn off uh, at the quickest intervals to help with frequency, regulating the frequency of the grid. And also in emergency curtailment events, when you have to drop down demand and increase supply, they're there at the, at the fastest rate. Whereas some of these other flex, uh, say flexible small commercial loads or industrial loads, those flexible loads are perhaps need a 30 minute window. They need a 30 minute uh, warning before they're gonna be able to shut down their operations. What, do you have an example of a, a, a commercial industry that would be flexible or inflexible? Sure. Yeah, so a, fle a flexible commercial load would be something like, uh, or a flexible industrial load would be like a steel mill, a uh, petrochemical plant, uh, you know, down in uh, Corpus Christi, somewhere on the coast or something like that. That mm -hmm. big power draw, you know, prior to Bitcoin mining were the largest power consumers in the state of Texas. Uh, and, uh, well, they still are by in aggregate, right? There's probably 15,000 megawatts of this kind of load in Texas whereas there's only 2,200 megawatts of Bitcoin mining. But as, as you talk about like the speed at which it's scaling and also the, uh, the size of each individual facility, a Bitcoin mine, you know, maybe 100, 150 megawatts, that would be an extremely large steel mill or petrochemical plant. Well, one thing that you were saying that, that kind of stuck out to me was when you were talking about some of these commercial, that oh, it, it may take them like 30 minutes. And you said that, like that was a long time. And I can only assume it's because Bitcoin can turn off like rapidly. I would, I, would, yeah. I would think 30 minutes would be rapid, especially for like a steel mill or something commercial like that. Well, it used to be, that used to be the best you could get. But now you can get people that are responding in seconds. And in some cases, even milliseconds. Now that is the most um, advanced technology uh, is to be able to respond to frequency events in milliseconds. And you have to be a special kind of load, a controllable load resource mm -hmm. on the grid to be able to do that. So that is that is the exception. But um, as a rule, Bitcoin, uh, or excuse me, grids are being managed in operations centers across the world. Uh, and here in ERCOT in Texas, you've got a operations center, uh, the ERCOT operations center. They're having to manage those grids on a second by second basis, looking at what the frequency is, how much re uh, physical responsive capacity or reserves do we have? What's our demand look like? What's our current generation capacity? And that's a very difficult thing to do. One thing, like when I was looking at this graph on, on LinkedIn, like I wasn't, I wasn't even processing what it was saying. Like now after you've explained, like obviously as residents, Oh, hey, we need to conserve energy. They're talking to somebody else. They're not talking to me. Yeah. You know, when when the government says, "Hey, it's hot outside. Maybe turn. Maybe don't let your AC. My AC is running right now. They're, I'm not. I don't want to come home to a hot house. Yeah. You know, and it's it's always they're always talking to somebody else, not yourself. Um, so, 
the, 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 when I see that it's the inflexible, now it makes sense. And I would not, not even think that other commercial uh, industries would be flexible because I would assume they would be in a similar way. It's like, because if they're not on, they're not making money. Right. So do, are there other commercial industries out there using the steel mill as, a, as an example that have relationships with the power companies to where if they need to shut down, they're not going bankrupt? Yeah, and it's all based on incentives, all based on prices. So when power prices are low, everybody's on because power is cheap. Right. But when power prices start to increase, which is a proxy for stress on the grid, that means we're using a lot of power and we're coming up to that point of, do we have enough power to supply all the demand? So prices will increase. There's only a few loads out there that will respond to price. Um, and so these commercial loads, now if you're like a, uh, a shopping mall and it's 4 p.m., you're not going to turn off your power to the shopping mall. It's just not going to happen. So because uh, you've got all these customers in the mall, it would be a huge disruption to business. You don't care how expensive power gets, you're going to keep power on. But if you're um, a petrochemical plant and you're looking at this and saying, all right, well, it's going to cost us $250,000 to shut down operations, you know, to revamp operations and, and turn back on in a couple hours. But we're going to we're going to we have a, a hedged contract with, pow with power. We have a, we've purchased a forward hedge, a block of power. If we turn off now and sell that power back to the grid, we're going to make five hundred thousand dollars. So in those few hours, they make an economic calculus. And that's the reason why you don't turn your AC down at your house, because there's no monetary incentive for you to do that for right. any residential consumer. And we can get that changed eventually. Right now, it's not even possible for a residential consumer to get compensated for curtailing, uh, except for in some bizarre, unique situations that don't apply to hardly anybody. Um, but you know, imagine if you had your Nest thermostat and you could say, hey, if, if I'm gonna make, you know, say 50 cents a kilowatt hour, on turning off, then yes, you can curtail my, mm -hmm. my energy. Hey, it's Amy. Click over here to subscribe, click over here for more content, and we'll see you next time.